Welcome to the About Violence podcast. I'm your host, Tim Kennedy, and uh, we are going to be talking about the good and bad of violence. That's the point and the purpose of this podcast. With me is Chantry Coker and Travis Joyner. Hello. Hey. Good Glad afternoon. Glad to be here, man. Yeah. We've been talking about this for a while. Yeah. And we're off, though. It's crazy. So this is our first one. And uh, this podcast, uh, we've, we've been wanting to do it. We have been needing to do it. And now here it is. Um, my background is uh, now 17 years in special operations. I'm a master sergeant in special forces, um, Iraq, Afghanistan, and then about 20 other deployments throughout the rest of the world. Uh, black belt in jujitsu. Obviously, I fought professionally for the UFC, fought for the world title a couple of times for Strike Force, and um, I have seen the good and bad about violence. And I thought it was really important, probably now more than ever, for real experts that know violence unlike anyone else to really talk about what violence is and uh, how dangerous it is and all the different forms that it can take. So that's my background, Chantry. My name's Chantry Coker. I did uh, four years in the Navy, got out, uh, honorable discharge, went on to be a uh, EMT, worked on an ambulance for about two years, and then moved on to being a firefighter, spent six years as a firefighter. And then got tired of that and decided to go be a cop. So I've been a cop for about seven years now. Um, I've done everything as far as like patrol. I've done some plainclothes stuff, doing like street crimes. Uh, and then moved on. Now I am on the SWAT team, full-time SWAT team. Travis Joyner here. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, so I've done martial arts most of my life. Um, Jiu-jitsu is kind of my thing. I'm a black belt in jujitsu used to compete professionally in mixed martial arts. About 16 years ago, I decided I wanted to be a cop and uh, went through the academy. Been doing that since then, just like Chantry. I've done uh, a lot of different things under that umbrella. I've worked um, patrol setting, I've worked in plain clothes, I've worked investigations, uh, and I found myself in a training role now where I train defensive tactics for law enforcement, as well as a little bit of firearms also. So the, uh, in this era of the world that we're living in right now, you know, violence is, I think, more prevalent and occurring more often in inconsistent ways than we've ever seen. You know, if uh, you, know, you, you go back to the World War I, World War II, you'd see these large violent occurrences that would happen in war, and it's really limited to, to that specific use of violence um, as you know, kind of after the 60s and 70s, we started seeing it happen in society more and more in less controlled ways. Um, now in 2022, you see somebody hopping in a vehicle and driving through a crowd. You see active shooters. You see um, violent crimes uh, are at a record high throughout the whole entire nation and pretty much every single cosmo cosmopolitan metropolis type city. Um, so you also see a, a society that is less capable to fight violence than ever before. Um, I, and for me, the, one of the reasons I wanted this podcast um, f was we have a unique opportunity. We, we um, on this side of, of the cameras and mics, because we have literally dealt in violence our whole entire adult lives. Yeah. Like this is all we've ever done. Yeah. Uh, good, bad. We see like people think they know violence. They think they've seen violence. Um, they haven't like very, very, very few people have ever seen what real violence looks like. And, you know, I, I don't want to break how ignorant and naive they are, but it's, it's important for people to realize how dangerous it is and how important it is for people to be prepared to address it. Uh, yeah, I, I think a lot of people don't have a realistic idea of what, like you said, they don't know what real violence looks like. And they have this um, this movie perception of how they're going to react to it, even though they've yes. never trained. Uh, they just saw it on TV and they're like, well, that's what I would do, you know, if I was in this situation, um, which is a great thing, like Sheepdog Response, whenever people come in and train and they see like just how powerless they can actually be whenever they're going against somebody that's motivated or just a little bit more in shape or, you know, whatever it is, some training. Uh, and then you talked about it, the gap between like the really violent people, you know, the, the wolves out there, the, the predators, uh, 
they, they've always been predators, right? They've been doing it their entire lives. A lot of them started, you know, fighting or whatever they had to do at very young ages. And then we have like this very soft population that's been very well protected and isolated and they don't seek out uh, how to prepare themselves to deal with those situations. So there's a lot of contributing factors, I think. Yeah. The, um, just in the past 24 hours, we, we have seen two instances of, I think, extraordinary hero, like heroic heroism. Um, one was a young man, 22 year old, 22 years old, responding to an active shooter at a mall in Indiana. Um, he is barely trained. Um, he is, he was legally carrying in a place where that should have been a pretty soft target. And, um, he heard the sound of gunfire and he ran towards it and, and saved who knows how many people's lives. Um, a few hours later, a pizza delivery guy is driving down the road. A house is on fire. There are children inside. He pulls over, hops out, runs inside and carries out five people out of this home. That's on fire. Oh, I hadn't even heard about yeah, that. I hadn't heard yeah, about that. that that's in the past 24 hours. That's the, this is what has happened. And, you know, for, for evil to conquer, it takes good men to do nothing. And I think a lot of people think that they're going to respond a certain way, and they don't. Yeah, absolutely. Like, it takes um, inoculation to stress, right? Like, you have to deal with stress in order to know how to deal with it. And if you've never been there, you're going to shut down. It's just, yeah. it's, it's human nature. You know, I was thinking about it like my entire adult life, I've worked in that that realm of like people's worst day of their life. Right. And so you get so inoculated to it. You get so used to it that it becomes mundane. But then whenever you're around other people, you're like, why are you freaking out right now? You know? So you have to, um, we have to spread that though. That's part of our training here is, you know, getting people inoculated to that stress. Yeah. And I think it's like any task, right? You have, if you've never done something, you have this kind of idea in your head of like how you would do or how you would perform. Right. I've never ridden a bull like I have in my head, like how that would go. But yeah. the reality is I have no idea. I've never felt it. It's the same thing with that. Like, you know, you got to know, you got to know where you stand. I have a two second bull riding career. It was two bulls. <laughs> One second each. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. And positionally, it, you, you look at law enforcement, you look at the military, and I think there's an expectation that these people are going to respond a different way. I know we're going to talk about Ovalde later. Mm. Um, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about Ukraine. But like positionally, doesn't just because you are in a position that the expectation is that you are going to be able to go and do this thing, that position does not do anything for you to actually go and do the thing. Doing the thing of like executing violence. You said it. Inoculation, training, preparedness. Like there are millions of little things that you have to do to be able to respond a certain way. And being in a position is not one of them. Yeah, no. Just because you wear a thin blue line shirt doesn't make you. No. Yeah. 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 You know, just because you go to the park and you you you, you play war doesn't yeah. mean you get to go and do war. Just because you you know go to a couple of courses that does not mean that you're prepared to do these things. Um, you're on the right track. You are, and it and I applaud you for it. But you got a lot more to do. Yeah. The definition of violence is behavior involving physical force intended to hurt, damage, or kill someone or something. And I mean, that sounds violent. Yeah. There's good violence and there's bad violence. There's times that violence is super appropriate and really, really necessary. And there's times that there's a better approach. And uh, guys that are good at violence, I, you know, we're, we're going to be having a lot of different people with a lot of different perspectives sitting at this table with us. Um, we uh, we we already lined up a couple of great ones. Oh, One yeah. of them is is a young woman. Uh, she's gay. She's awesome. You know, she uh, she is she is the antithesis of kind of who we are in the sense like as we're two hundred and something pound men that train martial arts all the time that have been doing violence our whole entire lives. She has been exposed to violence and and in a really traumatic way. You realize how vulnerable a lot of marginalized groups are, and how important it is to understand violence. Um, Ukraine, Uvalde, like the list goes on and on where you see the opportunity where violence could have been used to save life and it didn't happen. Yeah. Instead, bad violence happens. It's happening one way or the other. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And it's gonna, um, so it's going to happen one way or another. We want it to happen in the preservation of life. Right. Sometimes violence is the best way to do that. Absolutely. Um, 
was it Marcus Aurelius that said uh, there, there's a peace that can only be found on the far side of war? You know, s- sometimes that's true. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's at the negotiating table. Sometimes it is via speed, surprise, and violence of action, and the whole entire thing is done. My brother, he's a giant like you. You know, he's just this big, awesome dude. And um, he could diffuse what could... I'm, I'm like this rabid little animal in the corner <laughs> that's just like, you know, chomping at the bin. I want to go get in a fight. And like, this is where teenagers, and he could walk up and as this giant human, just talk his way out of anything. But there were just a few times I remember I watched him take his big meat paw and in what was a peaking moment that should be a fight, he just would slap this person. And it was the, it was a surprise, the, totally unexpected. You just, boom, slap this guy. And that's the end of it. Yeah. 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 Some, like sometimes people just have to get checked, right? Yep. Yeah. I mean, you see it all the time uh, on patrol on the streets, right? Where it's like people start to think they want to get crazy and you just, you don't have to smack them in the face, obviously, but like you just show a little bit of assertiveness and shut it down early. Same thing with parenting, right? Like sometimes you just have to check, like you just have to, to check it early before the other side gets momentum. Right. And, and, we saw that with Uvalde, right, where they didn't check it early um, and it built momentum and grew into this huge thing. You see it in all these instances. Yeah. It's- yeah. So um, as this being our initial podcast and this being uh, the, the, the first of what will be many, uh, goal is for us to do these every single month. Uh, the format is going to be first addressing current things that are happening that involve violence. And then we are going to be bringing in guests to do interviews. Some of them are experts in violence in some form of it, or others are have experienced it in bad ways. And we are going to kind of debrief them to exploratory, find out what could have happened, what could have happened different. Lessons uh, learned. Yeah. And, and also the effects of it. You know, the... Um, it's a frightening thing. Yeah. And it's such a broad spectrum too. Yeah. It's such a broad spectrum when you talk about guests and all the, the little areas under that umbrella of violence that yeah. we can talk about. Surviving a bear attack. Yeah. That seems violent. Yeah. yeah. Could you imagine? Uh, Montana, California woman hiking. That was the first predatory uh, uh, death of they know that this bear was specifically hunting her and killed her. Uh, it happens very rare. Oh yeah, but it happened. <laughs> you know, terrifying. Um, I uh, I I like obviously I like to hunt, and there has there's nothing more unnerving while you're out and you think that you're the apex predator, <laughs> and then all of a sudden you look and there's a, a big cat. Oh yeah, like you hear that scream, you're like, Ugh. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's real. Yeah, I, I there was a time I was walking and I I felt. Like I just felt that sixth sense of something's watching me and sitting up in a tree was a mountain lion. You know, a cougar was just sitting there just looking at me. You know, it wasn't like in pounce position. Right. It was probably 80, 100 meters away and just effortlessly disappeared out of view. And I have no idea where it went, but um, like not apex predator in this moment. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Those things are terrifying. There's some scary shit out there, man. To... Uh, acts of violence because of racism, you know, in the, the mall or the supermarket shooting where you know, the guy went and specifically was targeting blacks right. at yeah. a grocery store, you know, un- unpacking motivations and behind, b- behind it. Yeah. I uh, talked to one of my friends who's actually from Buffalo and he was saying like where that is, like he went there, he chose that specific supermarket in that part of town speci- specifically for that reason. Yeah. And then, you know, you even watch the video and like he, points his muzzle at like a white guy and says, sorry. And then, you yeah. know, that's where the, the feed comes. Oh, yeah, but no it's doubt. Like, it's insane. Yeah. You know? To uh, places of worship, you know, we see violence happening in both directions where people are targeting um, a black Baptist church or a um, white Pentecostal church or a Jewish uh, synagogue or a mosque. You know, you, you, you see it and... Um, I want to, I want to understand 
the motivation behind the perpetrator a little bit, never to glorify them, but to, you know, like for know, know yourself and know your enemy. Like th those are important things for people that, that practice this job, that do this thing of going out and protecting people, knowing what the other side looks like. You know, I've, I've been working on trying to understand what an active shooter is, mm. who that person is for the past few years. And it is a hard thing. Yeah, that's a lot to unpack. Yeah. But, well, we have a lot of time to do <laughs> it. And we're going to bring yeah. some of the best and the brightest into doing it. So today we're going to talk um, about two kind of kind of current ongoing things that I, are, are internationally known. One is Valde and the other is Ukraine. Um, I got back from Ukraine 36, 36 hours ago. And um, uh, curiously, as soon as I landed and I was going through immigration, uh, customs, border protection, as soon as they got my passport and uh, they got to the page where there's a Ukraine stamp in there, there um, she, she asks, you know, where, where are you coming from? I said, Amsterdam. She said, before that, I said, Poland. She says, before that. I'm like, you have my passport. It's literally in front of you. And before that was Ukraine. And she's like, okay. And she grabs the little orange slip, i.e. the secondary invest yeah. investigation interview and she slides on top of my passport. She's like, I'm just going to hold on to this. And I said, fantastic. And, um, she's like, well, it's, it's not a big deal, but we definitely want to debrief you. I know an investigator would like all the details about what it's like there. Um, not just what you were doing there, which we want to know, but also what it's like on the ground. And I, I was really clear. I'm not in there in official capacity and I have nothing, I've, I have nothing to say as the, you know, the U S government is not there and the war crimes that are being committed there. Like if you want to find out about them, you can come with me next time I go over there. And, uh, but it was, it was really curious to, to watch, you know, a government official, they wanted to know essentially what this podcast is about is what does it look like? Yeah. They don't know. Yeah. Well, that was the thing, you know, we talked about, um, kind of what we we're going to cover, you know, and you put out Ukraine and I was like, well, let me research this a little bit. The information is so far, like from here to there, like yeah. it's so polarizing. Um, I got a text last night at three o'clock in the morning and uh, the text was explaining to me, I'll just read the first sentence. You are on the wrong side. Russians got the point. And stop this charade that, oh, look at me, I'm fighting for the Ukrainian side. What a great dude I am, first of all. And then it goes on berating me about. And uh, in, in this ignorant text, it goes on and on regurgitating all of the propaganda talking points of the Russians, you know, and I, I could, I could sit there and Google and I could use all the Ukrainian propaganda. I can use all the Russian propaganda. I could go on CNN and use all those talking points. I could go, I could talk to what you two, like he just was in Kiev filming a music video. I could use everything that he just said. And I can go over to Fox. I could use all their talking points or I could do what I did, which was know that human life is important and go over and try and help and understand something firsthand. There's nothing like firsthand information. And, uh, and the, 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 the spectrum of, of people that I have to deal with right now yeah. that are speaking from positions of ignorance. Uh, so like we want to know real information. And I, I think we're going to really be diligent and make it inten intentional that everybody that's at this table and we're talking about a topic will be truthful and factual as best as the information that, that exists at the time. When Uvalde first happened, um, I think we all had the worst fear of what the response was. Yeah. I was texting both of you as it was going down. Right. And then by the end of the night, I was furious and irate. And then we went back and forth a little bit. Um, you know, it's, it's too soon for us to pass judgment. Wait, wait for the facts. Yeah. Right? Wait, wait for the facts. Um, cause I, you know, if you, if you, if you wear a badge, if you wear the uniform, if you have got, if you've got that American flag on your shoulder, uh, and you are in a position to go and do a specific task and you don't go and do that task. Yeah. I, yeah. You know? Yeah. So let's, let's, uh, let's dive into a day. Let's do it. All right. Yeah. Okay. So Valde is a small uh, city that is southwest of San Antonio. 
Yes. It's about an hour outside of San Antonio. It's a small community of, um, I'm just guessing here, 30,000 people. Yeah, hey, I don't know. It's, it's, it's small. Or population of Valde is... Even less. 29,300. That was a solid guess, sir. Yeah, it's pretty good. Um, so, not a lot of schools there. Um, not a big... They don't have a full-time SWAT team like Austin. Right. The training, the more rule that you get... Um, we're trying to build the context of what this place is. First, law enforcement. Um, the more rural of a department you get, the less standardized training and the less specialized training that you get. Yeah, absolutely. Um, on the school side, the more rural you get, the less um, built out are the physical schools. You know, if you go to a school that is in the city of a population of 29,000 compared to, you know, a school here in Austin or, you know, where we're sitting right now in Cedar Park. Um, the schools here are a way different thing than the school that you're going to see in Uvalde. Yeah. Yeah. I looked at the building. Yeah. The structure. I mean, how old do you think that building was? I was shocked to see that they even had their own like, uh, ISD police, mm -hmm. honestly. Yeah. You know? Um, the demographics, it is, uh, blue collarish, a lot of field workers, um, a lot of farmers, a lot of ranchers that uh, help manage all of the land that is Southwest Texas. You have, um, oh, I'm going to guess, seventy percent, eighty percent Mexican, Hispanic, yeah, yeah, that, that live in Valde. Is it Latinx now? Is that I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know the the, I think the, <laughs> the correct appropriate way to refer to the Hispanic this community is for sure going to be a politically correct podcast. Yeah, like we obviously go ahead and put that in our charter. And, um, so the bad guy, the asshole who shall not be named, um, he's prepared. He's got good equipment. He, uh, he knew where he was going to be going. He'd been planning this for a long time. Yeah. Like he had told people online, like basically he'd told multiple people that, like, Hey, this thing's happening in May and, and everybody just kind of ignored him. You know, he was getting people trying to buy guns for him. Like he spent what, six or $8,000 on. Yeah. Firearms, like the amount he ammo. had to spend on that was pretty yeah. high. He had, yeah. I don't know where his money came from. We, I heard that come up a lot. I think I, I think I heard a theory that maybe he had taken his grandmother's credit card or something. Yeah, they talked about purchase. that. And the fact that he like lived with his grandmother and so he had no expenses and he had had a couple of like you know burger joint jobs and stuff. He had stockpiled money. It's possible. Um, how did he come into possession of the firearms? So he wound up. He had asked like two relatives, I believe, to buy them for him, and they said no. And so once he was of age, he bought them. He, his uncle like drove him to, I guess the, the gun store is also like a burger joint or something. And so it was a, a, what I read in one of the reports, if I'm not mistaken, was his uncle said he thought he was taking him to go get some food or something. And he walked out with a, a rifle box and he had bought a rifle that he had ordered online, I think, and shipped to the FFL there yeah, locally. The two air platform rifles from a friend, federally licensed gun store uh, the day after his birthday. Yeah, so he had been, he is clearly waiting to do this. And then um, the amount of ammo too there. Yeah, 375 rounds. 375 rounds, uh, 5.56. Five, he wound up ordering like thousands more online though. I think he probably just bought whatever they'd sell him there, you know. I mean, that's not cheap these days. No. Um, so getting into the building, we, we've talked about how, how do we prevent this from happening. One of them is obviously making schools hardened targets where you have limited points of entry. Um, you like you walk into this building, you, uh, you have to be let in to come through the front door. And then once you get let in through the front door, you are in a little re rectangle that you can't get out of. You know, you are stuck in a kill box when you come into our building. And then to move out of that room, you have to be allowed to move through the next Fate, like the next segment of the building. Um, this is how most schools are built now. You have um, the first, mm, eh. well, as they're building schools, Newer this schools. is how they are now building them. But they're like, 
yes, but no, right? Like, um, there's still doors propped open at any yep. school you go to, right? Like, that's what drives me the probably the most crazy about this whole thing is since Columbine, nobody is nobody's addressing like the real issue of like if we really wanted to protect the children, why aren't we securing the schools? Like, yeah. banning guns or mental health is what everybody always wants to go to, and it's like those are long game long stuff. Term. But even if if you take away all guns, like how many kids could you kill in a kindergarten class with one of these weapons off this table? Yeah. Right. Pretty sure you can get 19. Yeah. So like, why is it harder for me to get into Costco than it is to get into my kid's elementary school? Yeah. I can, uh, I, I can get into a plane. Uh, and I have to go through multiple layers of security to get on that plane, um, to get through Costco. I physically have to prove that I'm allowed to be there for me to get access into the one way that you're allowed to get in. Um, all the other doors are alarmed. They're all like, why are these doors not alarmed? Why are they not better secured? You know, the, the practice of the common practice of teachers propping doors open, like that should be a huge offense, right? Like yeah. it should it's be like, no one wants to accept it that, yeah. we, that we need that. Like, yeah, we all agree that we shouldn't have to live in a world where that's necessary, but, but it is in a world that, it's but necessary. it is, but and, you don't and, see this stuff happening in, in, uh, Israel right? Where they're under constant terror attack. Uh, these aren't happening at the schools in, in Israel. So why is that? It's because they're hardening their schools. Yeah. Right? They're hardening their schools and they have a society that is addressing mental health. You know, they, they went ahead and took the long approach. Like they started realizing every single person serves their country in some form or capacity. Yeah. Um, the, the, there is nothing more dangerous than a broken young man. And we have a lot of broken young that's men. That's what you said. That's the, the, the reoccurring theme on all these, right? Is like, they're all the same, like... They're all the same fractured, yeah. broken little child. And you know what? Violence, being used for good or being used for bad, when, when that masculine testosterone energy is directed at something in an unhealthy way, it is so dangerous. Absolutely. Yeah. We're seeing that now more than ever. And you know, I was talking about how difficult it is to understand this active shooter. The one commonality among all of them, like some of them came from affluent fa families. Some came from very poor families. Some of them had, um, a lot of them were raised by uh, a single mother as their kind of sole care provider. Um, you saw that a lot of that. You saw a lot of medication. Um, you saw a lot of uh, history in receiving bullying. But the one thing that you have across all of them is that they are broken young men. Yeah, agreed. And uh, on the school shooting side, when you look at every single one of these schools, they are soft targets. So let, let's let, let's define the difference between a soft and a hard target. What is a hard target? They're going to have some level of security protection. Uh, they're going to have, I mean, if you're talking about physical locations, right, you're talking about places that are hard to gain access to uh, maybe not just the building, but even the facilities around it, the parking lot, anything like that, you know, where you have controlled access points getting into uh, security, security cameras, you know, fallback places to where even if those things are breached, then you can get to the next level of security. Yeah. It's a hard problem to solve, right? Yeah. Any, anything with the right tool and resources and equipment can be solved, but the more layers of security, the harder it is that problem is to solve, especially for an individual. Yeah. So um, on that spectrum of hardened targets, oh, let's use like a nuclear power plant. Uh, cool. On the special operations side, we, we have uh, one of the missions that sometimes we're tasked in doing is to go check out the vulnerability of certain national assets. So, hey, can you go play as the bad guys and go to this location and see if you can solve this problem? You know, so uh, a nuclear power plant, you have the exterior perimeter, which is completely surveilled. You know, you're going to have not a single inch of this fence line and the access points that are not physically observed. Uh, so uh, any, any object, the wall of China is only good in preventing people from climbing over it where you have people to stop people from climbing over it. So any obstacle that is not observed is not really an obstacle. Uh, nuclear power plant, every single inch of their exterior perimeter is observed and controlled. They have limited access, access points, multiple ones. So you have a thing that pops up that stops you from driving in and there's somebody that will look at you and you have to have the right 
credentials for you to get access into this place. And then that thing goes down and you're allowed to move in. Now, in that first moment, you are stuck there. They have some really rad weapon systems that will end your day in this little box and not allow you to go in. If somehow you are able to get past this kill box, you then move into another secondary phase of control where they have ways to stop you as you approach the main facility. Once you get to the main facility at the parking lot, they have another set of overwatch where, where the cars get parked. Somehow, if you're able maybe get past the first, the first and second, and now you're in the tertiary, every single inch from the parking lot to the main buildings is observed. Then you go to go into what you do for your, lit, for your job there, and you again have to prove via access, limited access, that you are there to do that thing. So even if you had a reason to be, to get on there, if you go into a different area that you don't have a, uh, the right permissions, you're then stuck again. Um, so that's going to be on the far end spa- spectrum. Right. You know, when, and then uh, still on hardened targets, some hospitals, some military bases. Uh, yeah, I mean, even in hospitals, you know, like you can only go so far into hospitals before you have like you have to start badging your way through doors and stuff like that. Right. So uh, even basic government facilities. Yeah. <laughs> the Pentagon. Oh, the Pentagon's like possible. remember the little uh, little surprise they have when you get off the railroad or the the, the train that yeah. goes in there. <laughs> Take that corner. Oh. Um, I was at the Pentagon a couple of weeks ago. I am a special forces senior NCO with a top secret security clearance, and I go through the front and I have an appointment to be there, and I still get stuck in in their bulletproof locked sector with people with guns that are proving that I'm there. And then I still had to wait 30 minutes yeah. as they positively ID'd that my appointment was me and my military ID was the thing. There are two t- Tim Kennedys, uh, apparently. Interesting. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> you should and fight him. I, 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 I would want to <laughs> Fighting him. for the ultimate title. Yeah. Need him you have to you change, have to change your, your name. Yeah. <laughs> there can be only one. Like, I got stuck in essentially the kill box waiting permission to be allowed to go in there. Uh, and I do believe our military is important and I know everybody in the Pentagon is important and I know people in the, in the hospitals are important and I know people in Costco are important. I know people at nuclear power plants are important, man, but kids are more important. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to degrade those other, like we don't have to take those other people's right. uh, hardening down. Right. Just saying, let's protect our kids. Yeah. Like, I think that everybody can get on board with that. It's just crazy to me that it hasn't happened yet. You know, like since 99 was Columbine, right? Like. How has it not become the main talking point? Like, why is all this money that we pay in taxes and all that stuff, why hasn't it gone towards that? Yeah. So most of your property taxes are what goes to schools. Right. Uh, I pay a lot in property taxes. pay a taxes. lot of property taxes. I can definitely buy a couple of locked doors, I'm sure. Yeah. And security cameras. I mean, we, we, I, we have tested cameras that can tase you. Yeah. They're coming out with some interesting stuff. Yeah. We, we, we have locks that I press one button and the whole entire place, uh, you know, the, the magnet, the, the magnet permissions that are electronic that go to a single hub. There's one person sitting there monitoring anything. And when they go like this, not a single door can be opened, you know, and there's also like drop downs in hallways where you can lock somebody into a specific place and nobody can move more than five feet when I press one button. Yeah. Not in the schools. I guarantee that there's fire suppression systems in all those schools, and I bet that they're all up to code. Why isn't there a code on this, on yeah. locks, right? On securing the building. All right. Let's get into the chronological order of events. And um, I don't want to watch the video. I've watched it a few times, but I think we got to watch it at least the first couple of minutes. Yeah, the first for sure. five or whatever, I, maybe after, as he's at least after he's wrecked and he's making his way up to the school. All right, so at, uh, at 11.21 a.m., sends a text message that I just shot my grandma in the head. I'm going to go shoot up an elementary school. That's at 11.21. At 11.22 to 11.27, Shrew steals vehicle and drives to the school. 
they took grandma's car. Grandma was able to, she like survived, went to the neighbor's house to call the cops or something. At 1128, the shooter arrives at the school. 1129, the door on the west side of the building is closed and a teacher calls 911. At 11.30, Coach S Silva sees Shooter and warns to students. 11.30, Coach Silva is at the office. Somebody just jumped over the fence, and he's shooting. At 11.31, Shooter walks through the school parking lot. And at 11.32 is when kind of the business starts. So, um, you know, the, the clock being ticking... The first notification that something bad's happening is at 1130, where you're physically at the school, somebody, a staff member at the school. Well, he'd shot at those two guys at the funeral home, too, that were going to check on him after he wrecked, right? So, yeah. like, surely yeah. one of those guys set off the alarm bells, too, right? So we have, um, yeah, right around 1130. Okay. All right. Go ahead and hit this video, Doug. This is all super slow. We can probably fast forward all the way to where he's like making the approach into the school. That's him wrecking out in the yep. ditch. See the two guys like coming out through this parking lot. He And then you can see that they're obviously getting shot at because they dive to the ground and start running away. All right, uh, hit, hit pause for a second. So two dudes are walking up, doing the Good Samaritan thing. A vehicle just crashes in front of the school. And um, they start getting shot at. He, again, how you think you're going to respond to how you actually respond. The guy got three steps before he stumbles and falls. Yeah. Like, when was the last time that, you know, you went out and tried to run as fast as you possibly could? How about you? Uh it's been a while. I mean, the last time I did it, it wasn't like a conscious effort. I was chasing after someone. Yeah. So yeah. it's, 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 you, you know, you're not going to rise to the occasion. You're going to fall to your level of training. Um, like clearly that guy hasn't done a sprint in a while. Yeah. And you know, you, you, you think like, Oh man, I'm going to go help this guy out. And, uh, something bad happens. You go to get away and you can't even get away. It's, it's, um, violence is wild. All right, go on, Doug. Fast forwarding. So we're at 1131. Guys crashed into the school. And uh, now he's making his approach. So time starts, like the clock is ticking as of now. And one of the many faults has been to the communication. Yeah. There was broken systems. What the hell happened with dispatch? See, I'm not clear on like what was going on. If you've ever been ditch, dispatched to a call, you know that like sometimes you, it doesn't really make any sense. Yeah, uh, sometimes the information's there, sometimes it's not. Yeah, it's just, I don't know. I didn't, I haven't seen like all the call texts between dispatchers, but part of what I'm confused about is like the chief not having a radio, right? So who was getting it communicated to him like when, later on whenever the kids are in the school and they're saying he's in here shooting us, you know, like, I, I'm not sure the communication thing. I do not understand what happened here because, yeah. um, you know, obviously I'm in a much larger city, larger department. I think that we have better systems in place. So I don't know what their telephone game to an extent, right? You have the person calling this in who the description they're giving may or may not be good, may or may not be the relevant information you need. That's going to a 911 call taker. Then that 911 call taker is sending the information over to a dispatcher, and then the dispatcher is going over to the officers on scene. So, Who, how many call takers get, do they have? How many dispatchers yeah. do they have? Like, is it the same person? Like, I don't, you know, I'd have to understand more of their systems, but there was definitely a break uh, in that system. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I've experienced it firsthand. Uh, you know, we, we've talked about this, what happened at home. Yeah, the communication of that telephone game. Um, like, I call 911, that 911 goes to county dispatch, county dispatch then sends, or, the county call center sends it to the dispatch. Dispatch, like, essentially de-escalates and, and removed pretty relevant information. By the time it gets to the officers, it, it was yeah. not anywhere close to what was really happening at the time. Yeah. And I don't, 
I find it curious that we have not seen the timestamps of dispatch. When was the first 911 call? And what specifically was said? And then what was initiated off of that? Right. Uh, have you seen any of that? No, yet? no. I haven't seen any you of that. You know, it, and that's least. something you see like between like PDs and, and uh, school police, right? It's like, it'll come in, you know, they call in and say whatever. And they're like, they go to dispatch regular PD. And then PD's like, oh no, that's school PD. Send it over to them. Just like what happened at yours, where it was like county and city were bouncing it back and forth, trying to figure out whose responsibility it was instead of just getting it taken care of. So I don't know if that's what happened, but um, that's a possibility. Yeah. And then, like you said, if that's our system and we're having issues in a large metropolitan area, I mean, Uvalde, Texas, like who knows what their capabilities and facilities look like. Yeah. A, a, a great segue to 1132. The school gets, I'm using the most sarcastic fingers of locked down. Uh, locked down to me means you can't move. I would agree. That is, you're, you're stuck where you are. <laughs> um, two dudes get shot at in the parking lot at 1131. The school is locked down at 1132. Again, the systems being in place. How is there not the God computer, the motherboard of all security motherboards at every single school that shows me which, which doors are ajar. Yeah. And if that is my primary exterior uh, security, like if that is your access to my building, what is the secondary and tertiary? Like if, if, if I have a red light at a door that says that this door is open, this door is ajar, how can I not have a way to lock and isolate the access from that? Yeah. The technology's there. Like the technology's said, there. We have it. Like we, we, we can spend how many billions of dollars so, so, you know, some supporting something abroad, but we can't make our schools have a gate that comes down, you know? Yeah. It's insane. Like we either don't care about kids, which clearly we don't because our education system's a mess and our schools are a disaster and we're falling further and further behind the rest of the, na the, rest, of the rest of the nations on this planet. But okay, 1132. School goes into lockdown and 1133, oh, this boils my blood. Shooter enters the school. Right after the lockdown. After the lockdown. And they initially tried to blame the teacher saying that the door was propped, propped the door locked, open but that, was, that turned out to not be the case. Just the door didn't lock. Yeah. So, and they said like around all the doors, there's little painted rocks and stuff that are, because it's just so common to prop the doors. Um, and they also... You know, I read that they, they kind of ignore the lockdowns because they get so many lockdowns from uh, bailouts from people running from the border that they'll, like, uh, crash like and bail out. And so they had had, like, an insane number, like yeah. 90 or something, some insane number of bailouts. So, you know, the boy who cried, yeah. cried wolf, right? Like, yeah. they just... I mean, that that road le leads directly into Brackettville, which is one of the highest trafficked areas. That road goes directly to Eagle Pass, which is the... I mean, that is the peak of drug and human trafficking along the whole entire border is right there at Eagle Pass. So, I mean, th that, that road to, when you, when you think about uh, immigrants bailout, like doing a bailout, th this isn't some poor person from Venezuela that's trying to find their way to the United States. Yeah. These are hardened criminals that have, like the, the, the person that is claiming asylum, they already walked up to the nearest border patrol agent and said, I'm seeking asylum. Yeah. And they were welcomed in and they are being processed at the border. So that is like the, the first phase of the good group of people that are trying to make it. We are all immigrants. Every single one of us that live in this country, if you're not Native American, you're an immigrant. Well, you know, like welcome to be in America, the yeah. melting pot of the planet. The group that is good, they are stopped at the border and they turn themselves over and they start the immigration process or the asylum seeking. Whatever they're doing, that happens right there. The next group are the group that don't want to be um, interdicted by Border Patrol. And these are human traffickers, drug smugglers, or repeat offenders, somebody that has a criminal record. Now, if they have made it past Border Patrol and they have made it past the next phase, which is kind of the, the, Texas, to public, public, the Texas Department of Public Safety troopers along the roads, then you have specialty teams that are trying to interdict these guys on roads like this. So when we say a bailout and, and they were inoculated to so many bailouts, these, these are real criminals trying to get away from police 
whether they're smuggling drugs or smuggling people. And uh, like, it is legitimate that these lockdowns were happening because you do need a lockdown when a criminal bails out of a vehicle when yeah. he's yeah, running they're from desperate, the police. Right? Yeah, that des people would do scary things via desperation. What with the co the context of of what this school is is the perfect recipe for a disaster. Yeah, yeah, it was like a long time coming. It was only a matter of time before this happened or a bailout happened where a guy goes in there and yeah. you know you just the complacency had been built. Complacency over. by law enforcement, by staff. You know, by, by the physical systems and processes that were in place, like th this was the recipe for disaster. All right, 11.35, two minutes after the shooter has entered the school, Avaldi police enter the school. So if you watch the video. Yeah, let's go and uh, yeah. start the, go and fast forward all the way to hallway yep. video. So. Do you have audio up on this? God, I just want to tear that guy's face off. This poor kid right here. Yeah. My hands are sweating. I get so mad when I watch this. is intended for a little body to you just feel my blood pressure rising yeah it like turns my stomach you know we're, we're almost two minutes in here and we're still looking at an empty hallway we're still looking at not a single person running towards the sound of gunfire not a single school staff that has been trained to respond to this. No emergency action plan is in place. There are no school doors that are being automatically locked. There is no anything that has happened. We are now two minutes into the shooter being on school and nothing has happened besides the shooter doing violence. Okay, so at 11.35 and like 20 seconds is when the first patrol car rolls into the parking lot. Um, so there's still active shooting going on as they're coming in. He's yeah, saying he, shots fired. This guy doesn't even want to get past the doorway here. Why are these guys? All right, pause it right here. Why are these guys, this guy doesn't even have his gun out. Okay, so <sighs> hallways are tough. Yeah, but what's the formation here? Yeah, uh, when, when you're moving down in CQB in a hallway, you know, what, what we have here is a T intersection. You know, it's clear what the direction of gunfire. We know where the bad guy is. And it's, there are really set in stone guidelines about how to treat a T intersection and then how to move down a hallway. Um, watching guys switch back and forth. Um, nobody is in control and nobody knows what the movement or direction of travel is. Like th this, this is, is one of those things that alert puts out too. you know, like 
officers are able to get this training for free through. I mean, alerts right down the road. Yeah. From- yeah, alert, which which is the active the law enforcement kind of active shooter schoolhouse, is ninety minutes from where the shooting happened, and it's free. It's free training. Yeah. They'll come. Really they'll come good. to you. We, they'll come to you and put yeah, we just really really them. good, really good training. Yeah, like the guys that run that the program, the POI, the TTPs that they teach. That is real training, and it is ninety minutes from where this is happening. Um, speed, surprise, and violence of action. It is the best response to somebody doing bad things. It, speed, surprise, and violence of action. When bad guys are doing bad things and there's no resistance, they're just going to keep doing bad things. I, uh, I, I, I use a story that I, when, I was, when I was in Afghanistan, I was watching a village and I watched the Taliban rule in this village and they did terrible things to everybody in this village. Unimpeded, no resistance. They just went there and brutalized this village. Fast forward like a month and a half. It felt like I was living through deja vu. I'm at another village, similar size, and I'm in overwatch position. And yet again, I see the Taliban rolling all in. I saw this old man that was out in the yard playing with some of the kids. Most of the men were out working in the fields. The women were taking care of the house. Um, Like this is pretty tribal, small peasant village. But this old man goes and gets a muzzle loaded rifle and cracks a round off at the Taliban as they're rolling in. They, like a fart in the wind, scattered and disappeared. Now, I don't, I don't know how old this guy is because I was looking through a big, powerful optic on my rifle. He, but old men in Afghanistan look really, really old. Yeah. yeah. He could have been 200. Yeah, you don't know if he's... I don't know. He, he looked internal, eternal. But the, the, the most... Even just the display of aggression against aggression changes the dynamics of everything. That shooter is a coward. That shooter is pathetic. That shooter is broken. But just because he's pathetic, he's a coward and he's broken, doesn't mean he's not dangerous. No, extremely dangerous. Extremely dangerous. But a coward, an untrained coward, not meeting resistance, will continue to do violence until something eventually confronts him. Yeah. And he was unimpeded in entrance, and he was able to do anything for as long as he wanted Ultimately, this didn't change until somebody, phys- until he was confronted, and that was the end. And that was the end. And that's the thing is like you see them come in, and nobody really looked like they were ready to do violence on the behalf of the innocents. Yeah. Right. It's like you talk um, about the mindset. Yeah. Hunt, you're hunting someone. Yeah. When when we teach the Singleton Security Course, that word hunting. That is the word that we use every time that we talk about what is your movement and mentality look like when you go to interdict evil. You are the predator. You are the hunter, because mo- we talk, you're, you, you said mo- um, momentum earlier. That momentum shift happens like this. It goes from me being the tough guy doing anything I want to all of these completely unprotected children, to I'm shitting my pants. I'm scared to death. I'm throwing my gun on the ground and I'm being the coward that I am the moment they see somebody looking like you guys walking down the hallway. Which is why you see so many of these active shooters surrender. Yeah. Even though they have like a plan to, they yeah, plan to shoot it out or they plan to kill themselves, but they're they, cowards. They, 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 they got a plan. Yeah. They got a plan. But the moment that they meet any form of violence, they turn into the exact thing that they are, which is the, the most pathetic coward that could ever exist. Yep. And then you watch... My hands are sweaty and I'm still angry. My blood is like raging through my neck right now. This is this is what really got like all the other stuff. It's like okay, all right. So it, it, it's, it's the like, the first 120 of- seconds. That is processes that are broken. That is the hardening of the school and that is mental health that all caused that right two minutes of of murdering. Now from this moment on, this is a failure 
of a department. This is a failure of every single individual in that, in that hallway. And that is a failure of the training. And it's a failure of the culture though. Yeah. Right? Like, I mean, yeah. if we were to talk about, it, if we're going to, if we're going to call it out, like look at uh, what, like Minneapolis where they made it against the law for their cops to go seek out warrior mentality training or anything yeah. like that. They're like, they're softening police officers and you're watching police officers get second guessed and prosecuted time and time again for the past decade for doing their job. And so then you build this hesitant culture and you're not getting the training, you're not getting the funding. Um, and so society has helped create this Uvalde shooting. Like they helped create this police response. The next two minutes that we're going to watch here, um, this is a byproduct. I couldn't agree with you more. This, This is a byproduct of what society has forced our law enforcement become. If, if you want to look at what um, a police officer is going to do when you don't let them train like they should, it's going to look like this. They're, they're going to be unprepared. They're going to be mentally not ready. And they're going to be hesitant. They're going to have um, a degree of reservation in every decision that they're going to make. And none of it is going to be via speed, surprise, and violence faction. Not one of them. The decision will always be about um, mitigating liability and risk. It's going to be about... Um, lawsuits and you know the the how the washington post is going to write about an article about them the next day mm-hmm. how they're going to be the next cnn topic and the next protest and all yeah. these things you know and that 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 is this is the byproduct of that so when, when we talk about mental health and we talk about these big issues the society intentionally defunding um attacking and underhandedly removing any cultural support behind our police officers th- this this is what you get all right hit it doug so they're on the door the you got guys holding rear security back here position soul over here Police have been on the premises for two minutes at this point. They know exactly where the shooter is. I think you have eight, eight guys in the hallway right now. Yeah. Yeah. All right, go and hit pause. It's All right, we're 11.37. They've been there for three minutes. And uh, what we have is them stacked up at the hallway at the T intersection, looking down at to the room that the shooter was in that they knew he was in. And this is where they stay for the next hour and a half. Yeah. Yeah, this becomes their command post. Uh, imp- or kind of command post, even though nobody ever actually took command of the scene. Um, they just stand there. I, the, the guy here in the white shirt, I think he like crawls down by himself for a little bit, you know, and kind of gets a little closer and nobody follows him. So he comes back. Uh, there's just, it's wild, man. It's, I, it's wild to watch this. That's where all momentum died and it was not regained f- until 1250. I think is whenever Vortac finally made entry on it. Yeah, I know it's it. It feels easy to be on this side of the screen and sharpshoot what they did there. Um, all of us have not been on the side of the screen. All of us have been on that side of that hallway and uh, respond a very specific way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you. I think we've all responded to something that it's like you might get yeah, shot. I'm, I might yeah. get shot here. Yeah, yeah. like that's you're the running towards it, and you're like, all right, this might be the one. But you still go. But it, it's mindset, right? Like yeah. nobody wants to get shot. Like that's that's a human reaction, right? But what's on the other side of that door that's more important, you know? It's like yeah. 
I signed up. And if more than anything else, like you said, children, children are on the, the other only side like of that door. The only true innocence, right? Like there's, there's the drug rips and things like that to where it's the drug dealers being yeah. held by another drug dealer. You know, they put themselves in that situation. But these are like true innocents that deserve like... Uh, and you, they deserve you're being lives. given an opportunity yeah. to potentially yeah. save one of them. Um, Dakota wrote... Yeah, I, liked, I was actually about to bring that up because Dakota said he'd rather attend like 40 first responders funerals, right? Something to that, that effect. Yeah. So I'll just, I'll read it. Yeah. It got... Is it sensitive? Yeah, it got sensitive. All right. Um, I've been waiting to see what all comes out of this before rushing to comment. So here it goes. These cops are cowards and there's no excuse. They should be held accountable but trust me when I say it's not just their fault. It's the system's fault, and the scary part for the public is that it's not just with police. It's even worse in the fire service. See, when you call 911, you expect that you have people coming to help at all costs. That's only on a rare occasion. The training taught to first responders is mentality of not my emergency. It's their emergency, and we're only there to help. The first responders who are willing to train and give their lives for someone else are looked at as res reckless and unsafe cowboys by the fat, la lazy, selfish pension chasers that are taking the taxpayer's money. This will only get worse until the culture changes in leadership and accountability is passed through at all ranks. Also, sum it up with this. It's... It should be more acceptable to go to 40 first responders funerals before one child's funeral, because that that's what we signed up for when we took our oath. If we disagree, we aren't the same. Yeah. Dakota called me a day or two after Uvalde and, and in all of his elo eloquence that uh, Dakota has, he just said, bro, what the fuck? You know, yeah. we well, talked about that. that of like, I was like, and that was still early on. I said, let's just wait for the facts to come out. You know, I was trying to give them the benefit of the doubt, uh, but there's just, well, it's not there. And, you know, there's, there's a, a million different angles to go with this, but let's talk about training, all right? Yeah, we can all look at that and see the tactics and the movement and stacking on doors and, and things that we could improve on, right? From a training perspective, when you do baseline training, you, you set your students up for success, right? You teach them the learning objectives, you give them an easy softball scenario, and it's unchallenged, basically, right? If you do the right things, you win the scenario. You know, even if these officers are getting training, are they getting just the baseline training very sporadically? And we know they're not getting to the point where they're getting pushed in scenarios and getting shot at and having to, to deal with that, you know? Yeah. I had a... We, we ran that law enforcement protector one here during uh, what, what this April. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. And uh, we, we had a major from Texas Department of Public Safety. Vince. Love yeah, that. that thing. Yeah. yeah. He's, Good he's dude. a cool dude. What yeah. a great dude. Good dude. Shout out Vince. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he said something. He got mauled. Yeah. He uh, jujitsu is a superpower. Every police officer should train in it. It not only does it um, condition your body, it conditions your mind. It conditions your mind to be in uncomfortable positions that you have to work through that and you are not in control of everything that's going on. Actually, you're contro in control of exactly half of, <laughs> what, of what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Now, you're, you're fighting a fully resistant opponent that wants to do something to you that you don't want them to do, and you're trying with all of your heart and all of your might and all of your ability to do something to them that they're trying with all of their heart, all their might, and all their ability to not let you do. And that is this beautiful thing that is jujitsu. So when he got done, we were fighting for guns and knives, and Vince um, asked, why isn't every single police officer doing this? Mm. He, he recognized, and, and this is why I was so impressed by him in that moment, because I brutalized him. I dragged him to the deepest depths of the ocean, and I dragged him to the bottom of that ocean, and I drowned him there. And he comes up with the most beautiful, selfless, from a position of humility, being like, this is what every single police officer needs. He recognized in, in one moment that he had never experienced, and neither had any of his colleagues experienced what it feels like to be drowning yeah. In human suffering. And you don't want the first time you experience it to be for real. Yeah. To be for keep. Like you want it in that nice, safe, padded room where you have uh, semi psychotic Tim Kennedy, yep. the one that's doing it to you, right? Like, 
with a rubber knife. But when was the last time that these guys were in a hallway where someone was trying to shoot them? I mean, even in training. Yeah. When was the last time they did a force on force? Probably never. I mean, if I'm going to guess, never. I bet they've never done it. Never. I, I, I agree. I, I doubt that they, and the majority of these guys have never done a force on force school entry into the school that is in their freaking city. Every time we do like force on force training, like HR entries or something like afterwards, you're just like, all right. Like, yeah. Things to work on, you know, yeah. so there's such a huge uh, learning ability there, right? Like there's so much to learn from it. Uh, but if you don't do it's it, it's a perishable you, skill. It, it is. Yeah. It, so secure us. I'm an 18 Bravo. Well, I was an 18 Bravo, and that is a special forces weapons sergeant. And one of our tasks, one of the 18 Bravo's tasks, is the security of the base that you're stationed at. So if, if I'm going to a Ford operating base, um, once we get there and the ODA gets in there, I got our friendly, our friendly forces, our the whatever indigenous force that we're working with, I'm the one that's in, in charge of figuring out the emergency action plan, how am I you know, setting up the fields of fire, what does the security look like? I'm the one in charge of that. How many times do you think if... I'm in charge of a compound. Do you think that we cleared every single one of the buildings on that compound? All the time. All the time. All the time. How many times do you think that we would respond to the security front gate that everybody has to come through because I'm, I set up limited access and everybody is forced into a choke point because I have machine guns and, and, and automatic grenade launchers that if you try to get through any other way, you're going to have to deal with one of those freaking 50 cows on top of turrets. You have to come to one point and that one point has a guy with a gun that you have to deal with. How many times do you think that we drilled and practiced whether it was um, during chow time? whether it was during our workout time, whether it was during our classroom time, during our on-range training time, that we would just hit the button and we had to respond to something. We trained it all the time. So if it ever went beep and that flare goes up, you got 12 Green Berets that have rehearsed and practiced the exact thing that they're supposed to do. If you're a police officer and you have not physically cleared the school in your city, shame on you. If you're the police chief and you have not gone and talked to every single school principal and scheduled the times that you're going to go and have your police force work on clearing that building, learning every single angle, figuring out how they're going to make it more hardened facility, shame on you. Well, here's the thing with that, though. Double-edged sword or the, the counter argument to that is a lot of teachers and schools are not police friendly these days. Like there's been times to where you go to go into those schools and they're they're like anti-police. Yeah. That's like, a reminder, right? Yeah. Like we don't want to have to think about that. Yeah. So it's, it's, um, I'm not saying that was the case in Uvalde, but I'm just saying like some of these places you go to, it's just become so commonplace to like, just blame the police, just hate the police, uh, that yeah, I've, I've met resistance with school teachers and you know, those things They they just don't like police. Has to change. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's sad. Like, police officer is not one of the like noble professions anymore. It's, and, and again, what does that get for your recruitment? Like who are you bringing in as police officers if there's no real draw to the job? Yeah. Right. We need, uh, we need good men and good women again. Yeah. Powerful, strong, healthy, smart people that want to go and protect and preserve human life. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you're, 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 you're seeing it firsthand right now as a trainer. Um, oh, yeah. It's hard. It's rough. But even when you don't get the greatest population of recruits, you know, the, I know every generation probably does this. They look at that prior generation like, Pff. yeah, every, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what a bunch of, what a bunch of weak. Uh, everyone's, everyone had it harder and rougher and was tougher. And right now in basic training, I know that there's drill sergeants that are looking at this group and being like, how are these guys and gals going to go fight a war? You know, um, I know probably every police officer trainer at the academies right now is looking at this and be like, how are these going to be able to answer the call to go and do this? You can train people into doing this. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's a cult. It's a culture thing, right? Like you have to train the culture and the, the people will come. Yeah. But the problem is, is like you have the people, you have these few individuals that are ready to go handle this that come in and the culture beats them down or runs them off. So it's, it's a systemic problem, right? Like we've yeah. got to fix the whole culture of, of policing and training and uh, not having political activists being the ones that are running training. <laughs> uh, political activists that are embezzling every single one of their donors and contributors. So I'll go ahead and throw Black Lives Matter under the bus. Uh, 
you, you defunded the police and they embezzled you for tens of millions of dollars. That is, that is what happened. If you don't know, go and Google it. It is um, Black Lives Do Matter. And we should f- figure out in every imaginable way how to support those marginalized communities. But um, an organization that steals your donations and buys million dollar houses should be evil. And uh, we should throw them under the bus for what they are. All right. So I said there's three things that we have to do in response to this shooting. Um, I said, what do we do from here? One, we have to make our schools hard targets. Limited access points, armed guards, trained teachers and staff, and fail-safe doors and locks. That's one. Make our schools hard targets. Two, we have to address the mental health crisis that is a virus spreading across our nation. Our young men are broken. We as a society have been breaking them. We have emasculated them. We locked up society for a couple of years. We kept people six feet apart when every little boy should be running around, climbing, getting dirty, jumping, and most importantly, playing with his friends. We have to let young men be young men. They have to laugh. They have to struggle. They have to fail. Third, we have to, en- we have to enable law enforcement to be protectors again. This culture post-summer 2020 has limited police response, and we have turned them into this. So those three things... Um, I think we can do all at the same time. Yeah, I think it's going to have to start as like a grassroots thing, though. You know, like if people keep on looking for like Uncle Sam to come in and fix everything. They're not. No, like you fix, like Jordan Peterson says, make your own bed, right? Like fix your fix your house, like fix your peace, like be a better community member, take better care of your kids and your nieces and nephews and your community and be that leader for people to kind of follow. Um go to your schools, talk to them, like go to the, the police officers, find out why your city council isn't supporting the training, you know, find out why the, these officers aren't getting the funding to go get this training or the equipment that they need. Like it starts with the individual. Yeah. Right. And everyone watching that video gets upset, but it comes down to that. Well, what are, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. You know, what can you as an individual do? Yeah. Thoughts and prayers, likes, shares, and comments is not going to change anything. You should be at your school board. Get involved. You should be at your city, next city council meeting. You should be hammering your mayor's door down, making him change his school, making him make his city council allow police officers to go and get protector training learn how to fight, learn how to shoot, learn how to go out and save life. Because the way that you respond to violence like this is with speed, surprise, and acute violence of action. Yeah. It's the only way. There's, the there's, there's guys and girls out there that want to do that. Yeah. And they're willing to. And, and you know, having, you know, we've been with Sheepdog for four or five years now, right? And same for you. is like you see people come through as like they have nothing. They're blank slate. And then we see them return yeah. right? and they're return students or we see them, they're police officers that we work with that started as blank slates. And then a year or two later, you're like, all right, like they're, they're a force multiplier now, yeah. right? They're a force to be reckoned with and they're a force multiplier and they start drawing in other people, training, teaching, doing those things. Um, I mean, even whenever I, like we first became friends, like I was a terrible shot. I would say by, at least by my standards, I was barely shooting, um, no grappling. A year later. Yeah. It was, it was, it was wild. It was absolutely bananas. It was bonkers to watch you in a year transform. But it was just like, I decided that that was the thing. Like, this is my profession. I owe it it to my family and my community to be the best at whatever it is to make sure that I get home every night and that the people that are around me get home every night instead of just trying to collect a paycheck. And I really enjoy it. It's a fun process. I was like, wait, you're going to pay me to do the things that I like doing on, on my own anyways? Yeah, I'm in. Um. I love Texas. I love Valde. I, I just spent six months working in and around Valde, and it was uh, it's a great community. Only two coffee shops really that had decent cappuccinos. Um, <laughs> plenty of great tacos. People were great. So I want this to never happen again, and for it to never happen again, you said it. Grassroots. Yeah. Go. It, it's your time. vote, your local votes matter. Everybody worries about who the president is, but worry about who's on your school board. Worry about who's your city council member. Worry about who's your mayor. Like, fix your local politics, and you'll fix your community problems. And then we can start building. Yeah. Like, don't don't the 
who the president is affects your gas prices. That's about it. Right? Find like, out when your local law enforcement lasted active shooter yeah, training. Yeah. Find out why they aren't. Like, is it because of funding or is it because of political reasons or whatever it is? And start working on fixing those things. But yeah, start it at a grassroot level. And it, it, let it be part of your life. You know, it, it is, it is, if you're throwing stones from your glass house and you do not yourself as the individual, as that good citizen, um, I think in the next, in the next podcast, I'll read Roosevelt's definition of a citizen. He wrote a letter about it's a it. Good one. Yeah, it's it a good is one. a good one. It's beautiful. Yeah, like Ro- Roosevelt, the, the good Roosevelt that, you know, like hunted and fought and went to war. There's that one. Um, and Marcus Aurelius are, are kind of the, the two men that I, I shape all of my thoughts and approach, especially about violence. W W R D. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on the other side of that wall, we, I'm not sure if you could hear it through this mic. Do you think they can hear it through the microphone? Occasionally somebody slamming. It's a little bit, Doug. Uh, is, I don't know, 30, 40 people out there doing a no-gi no jiu-jitsu class. A couple of cops are out there. A um, couple of moms are out there. A couple of uh, guys that are coming in during their lunch break are out there. Uh, a bunch of the Sheepdog Response staff are out there doing their lunch, their lunch break during uh, grappling class. If you're not doing that and you don't understand what it feels like to have your heart pounding and it feels like your heart is in your throat and you can't take another breath, but you think you're going to be able to walk into a city council and tell them what they should be doing, I I caution maybe you first go and you start exploring, you start feeling what what it's like to be a good protector to your family and to your community and to your church. Yeah. You know, whatever, whatever your tribe is, you go and fix the individual that is you and then start positively affecting change around you. Absolutely. And then to the people that are uh, carrying, right? Concealed carrying daily, or those of you that have your concealed carry license and don't carry shame on you. Right. Well, like it's just, it's too difficult. It's too uncomfortable. It doesn't go with my outfit. Like you have, that's one of those things that you should do every day. Uh, but you also need to train every day with it. You know, like don't, don't be a holster for the other guy. And uh, who was it? Colonel Cooper that said, like, just carrying a gun makes you a, no more a shooter than ca- having a guitar makes you a musician, right? Yeah. So, like, you have to train, but you should be training. You should be that 22-year-old in the mall that saves countless lives because you want that from everybody else, so you have to start looking in first and start being that person first. It, 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 it's part of being what Ameri- being an American used to mean. I think we've lost that a little bit. You know, when you, when you set down the sword, the sword doesn't just rust and oxidize. You, you like the sword, become more useless. When you aren't training, I'm using this metaphorically, like when you aren't training with the sword, you, like your sword, are becoming less and less affected by the day. And you know, there was a time where we started getting reports that on the other side of an ocean that was really hard to cross at the time, there was a guy that was killing a group of people. We hopped on every single male, every single military age male, hopped on a boat, went across that ocean, climbed cliffs and ran up beaches of gunfire to stop this guy from doing violence. And that guy would have continued to do violence throughout the rest of the world until he had all of the world and he had eradicated every single bloodline that he didn't like until somebody met him with violence. And there were warning signs. There were early warning signs yep. that it was like, uh, you know, he's just taking back this yeah. little piece of the world that yeah. used to be his. You know, like, just like there were early warning signs here, it's, uh, well, I you, digress. You talked about training and carrying. I mean, there was two guys in that parking lot initially. You know, Could have been the end right it, there. It could have. and then, But then you got to ask yourself, like, put yourself in that situation have you realistically trained and prepared in the gear you're carrying are you prepared to confront someone with a rifle and an open ground like that yeah it's a tall order um there was a there there there's the beginning see if you can google it of an the start of an active shooter was uh i think it was a janitor a custodian confronted a shooter in the parking lot of a school and uh it's a really short short story it goes like this the bad guy drives to a school um, has an altercation, walks back out to his car to get a gun, and 
then he is interdicted in the parking lot. That's the end of the story. Yeah. That's it. There's, there's, there's no loss of life besides bad guy. There's no victims. There's no children. There's no funerals. It's been done. And, uh, That's no, that's it. not it, I don't think. But, I mean, it, it, it's happened more than once. There is. Maybe. Maybe it wasn't. I mean, it, it's happened more, yeah, yeah, more yeah, than once. Yeah. Um, and it was very, it was fairly recent. And um, I wish I could remember the exact city because it it, I'm pretty sure it was here in Texas. But that's how the story should read. Prick shows up in the parking lot. That's the end. Yeah. That's it. I mean, even not even we don't even get to any. Not even show. taking it as deep as like an active shooter, but how many acts of violence can you go watch multiple cell phone video angles of where nobody does intervened? anything? You know, there's the story. It was like in Florida, maybe where the woman was like raped on the train in front of me, or Chicago or something like that. She was raped on the the tram, like the the train, in front of like multiple people, and nobody intervened. Yeah. Got to change that. Like, put Gotta your cell phones away a little bit at a time and get up and help someone, you know? Well, um, you guys got anything else on Evolve Day? Do better. Yeah, do better. Go train. Lessons learned. Um, that, was, uh, that was a lot. Sorry, so far, our first and heaviest podcast, the, uh, this is a pretty heavy, heavy topic. Um, not all of them are going to be heavy, some of them are going to be funny. Uh, I know we have a couple of guests lined up that are that are hilarious. We'll bring in people that are very skilled at it and some that are completely ignorant to it but have experienced it in some some terrible sometimes, some beautiful ways. Um, but uh, you guys want anything else to add before we wrap? No. I, was, uh, I think we, we, hit, we hit what we wanted to hit. Talking about funny violence. I, I texted Gordon after the match the other day and was talking about the your because I was like excited whenever I saw it. I was like, ah, let's do Damian Padre. I was like, it's a it's a nod to Tim, right? So like my wife's looking at me like I'm crazy. Yeah. Uh, we we're laying there watching it, and so I text him the next day, and he's all disappointed. And I was like, as much like shit as people are gonna give you, I was like, just remember Tim did this to a guy in a charity match. <laughs> <I was> like <laughs> what? I was like yeah. So I sent it to him. I was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Good times. So about podcast or about violence podcast. Uh, go get trained, go stay safe, stay free. And, um, if you have any questions, if there's topics that you want us to cover, if there are, um, things that you want to know about, uh, you literally have three people that have dedicated their, their lives to understanding what it means to do violence on behalf of those that can't do violence for themselves, to go out and put their lives on the line, to protect those that can't protect themselves. And, um, that, that is a beautiful thing. It is something that I, I think has been demonized of late, but it is, it is a beautiful thing. There's, there's no greater thing that somebody can do than to lay them their life down for somebody else. And first responders, the good ones, will go and do that in a heartbeat. Um, I know we just watched a video of, of, of some people that weren't capable of doing it, but there are tens of thousands, if not millions of, of men and women out there that without a moment of hesitation would go out there and do the right thing. Hopefully this creates a cultural shift too. Yep. You know. All right, so this is the About Violence podcast. Instagram, find us. Yeah, find us on, on uh, Instagram and in the comment section. Tell us what you want us to cover and who you want to inter interview. Get on there, share this with everybody, and uh, take care. See you all next time.